in the Midwest, magnet for people uh, fleeing their countries, looking for political asylum. The largest, of course, is New York, and then Los Angeles, and then comes Minnesota. But in the Midwest, we are the biggest. So we have the second largest Hmong population. We have the second largest Tibetan population. We have the second largest Somali population in the United States. We have the second largest Liberian uh, population. And before that, we had an influx of Russians. Now look, right along in here. Off to your left, there is going to be a uh, McDonald's. <laughs> Not a big deal. But off to your right, right over here, there used to be an alleyway right in there. And the reason that I was driving past there is because there was a big shootout that occurred there in the 1930s, early 1930s. St. Paul has a unique reputation. In the 1920s, what was going on in the 1920s? Prohibition. That's right. J. Edgar Hoover. I remember him, J. Guy wore dresses. Anyway, J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover said, you know, if it hadn't been for St. Paul, Prohibition would have worked. And it's true. Because what happened was in the middle 1920s, the police chief and his brother, who was the labor leader, got together and they talked to a couple of people by the name of Ham. Remember that name? Ham and Bramer. Bramer is a banker. Ham is the guy who produced beer, Ham's beer. They talked to those guys and they said, what do you think if we open up the city of St. Paul to all the gangsters in America and let them come here? Okay? Now, please understand, this is before the FBI was formed. This is before you had the Bank Act, where the FBI could get involved in bank robberies that occurred in one state and moved to another. Or the car, what do they call it? the automobile thing. If you stole a car in Wisconsin, drove it to Minnesota, then the FBI could get involved. Before that, they could not. They could not. So this was all local jurisdiction. So they said, we'll just, we'll just invite all the gangsters here. They can live in St. Paul as long as they want. They can eat our food. They can buy our clothes. They can do all these things. However, they can't do three things. First thing, they had to do three things. They had to tell the police chief they were in town. The second thing they had to do was give him some money. The third thing they had to do was promise not to shoot our citizens or rob our banks. They could do that in Minneapolis, which they did with great frequency. <laughs> oh, yeah, and then they'd run over here to St. Paul. Remember, this is all locally controlled, so the cops in here, if they didn't do anything here, wouldn't arrest them. And they did this. Oh, they did. But then, see, they kind of went over the edge after a while. And so they decided this was not a good thing to do. But, so you got all these people, that, that the gangsters are in town. John Dillinger was in town, Catherine Barker, you ever heard of him? Catherine Barker, Ma Barker, Ma Barker and the boys. Uh, Elvin Creepy Carpus. Elvin, they said, he could look at you, he had steamy blue eyes, he could smile at you and shoot you right in half with a machine gun. There was another reason, too. If they wanted to, they wanted to change your identity in the 1920s, you'd go to a doctor. This one doctor would dip your fingers in acid. And they would burn the fingerprints off of your fingers, okay? That, that hurt for about two weeks. Or if you wanted to get your face done, this one doctor did Elvin Creepy Carpus's face twice. But he had a little problem. He drank all through the operation. Okay, so, anyway, Elvin Creepy, all these guys were here in the city of St. Paul. After Prohibition, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected, Prohibition ended. The great experiment was over. Within nine months, no, 11 months of his taking the oath of office, you could buy liquor any place you wanted to. So now what are all these gangsters going to do? They were shipping in alcohol from all over. They said that every second person in the city of St. Paul was making a hooch. Right? Yeah, it was, you ever heard of something, somebody called the blind drunk? Some of this stuff was so potent that you drink, you get a real bug, real good buzz on, you'd wake up the next morning and be blind the rest of your life. This is true. This stuff was vile anyway. So here it is. The prohibition is over. Now what are the gangsters going to do? One of them says, say, why don't we grab, remember this guy's name, Ham? Why don't we grab him, take him to Illinois, hold him for ransom? And they did, $100,000. Within nine months, they were broke. And you wonder what happened to a hundred thousand miles, a hundred thousand dollars, you know, with with eight guys doing the, doing a heist. They found in the chief of police's uh, what do you call it, the box in the bank, in a safety deposit.
plus cost, something in the neighborhood of fifty thousand dollars all by itself. So when you start to pay off people, the money goes pretty fast. So they decided that they would get somebody else. They got another. Did you hear this name before? Raymond, the banker, took him to Illinois, held him for two hundred thousand dollars ransom. There was a young guy, um, one man. Homer Van Meter was his name, and he was the gunman for a man named John Dillinger. And I'm going to show you where the major shootout was between John Dillinger and the FBI. But he had was involved in this shootout, escaped, went up north, went up to Indian reservations, lived there for a couple of months at each reservation, came back to Minnesota, went to this place right on your left, right on the corner. That used to be a dance for a million, 1,500 feet of dance floor so smooth you could dance all night long. And that was owned by a man named 